Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, before we get this show started, let me quickly tell you about a program that we just launched called Outside the Box. When we first started Brute, we simply served people that wanted to train for and compete at the CrossFit regionals and games. Pretty quickly, we transitioned to also working with people that wanted to compete in the open, people that just wanted to look better naked, people that wanted to compete in weightlifting, as well as a host of other goals. About a year and a half, we started hearing more and more from members and former members that their priorities were shifting, that their goals were shifting. They wanted to focus more on their relationships, on their careers, on new hobbies, and they didn't have the same desire. They didn't have the time or the means to train for an hour or two or three or four like they did when they first signed up with us. So we created this program with them in mind. Outside the Box is a 30-minute a day program for five days a week, and it requires minimal equipment. There are three different tiers. The first tier requires only a set of dumbbells, and each, each higher level requires more and more equipment. So whatever you have, we've got something for you. At Brute, we really, we really pride ourselves in bringing together experts in every area of the sport of fitness. And so when we were thinking about creating this program, we realized that we didn't have anyone that was an expert in general physical preparedness. So we had to go out and find that person. That's when we decided to team up with the founders of Warm Up and Workout, Pat and Taz Barber. Pat has been a... CrossFit level one and level two instructor, uh, as well as a flow master for years. And I've seen the level of programming that he and his wife have created for their company warm up and workout. And I can say without reservation that these guys get it better than anyone on the planet. So we found our experts, we created our program and it's ready to roll. If you're the type of person that really takes his or her fitness seriously, but you also want to have the time to focus on your careers, your relationships, your personal health, and you don't want to spend hours and hours in the gym anymore, then this program is for you. If you want variety in your programming, if you want to know that you're going to continue getting fitter without having to put in the same amount of time that you're used to as a high level competitor, then this program is for you. If you're interested, you can find out more at outsidethebox.fit. Hey, hey, welcome back. This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Cole Sager back on the show. Cole is a six time CrossFit Games athlete. He's placed top 10 multiple times and as high as fifth place. Historically, Cole has not been known as a quote-unquote open athlete, and as of last night, he placed sixth in the 2019 CrossFit Open. So to start this show off, we talk about exactly the mental shifts that he's made this year that have allowed him to really transform as an athlete. We talk about how he was unprepared in 2017 and what he had to do to shift and go on to have his best season ever in 2018. We talk about body image issues and finally his amazing marriage. Cole is one of my favorite athletes. He's a very wise young man, very intentional about the way he trains and about the way he thinks about his craft. And this one was a pleasure to do. So without further ado, Cole Sager. Cole, welcome back to the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, brother. As of 10 a.m., what day is it? The 20... Tuesday, the 26th. Tuesday, the 26th is when we were recording this. And you are in sixth place in the CrossFit Open. Dude, Yeah. congratulations. That's fucking huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it feels really good. Not going to lie. So... <laughs> Last night, as I was f- kind of finishing preparing for the show, I had in there because I, I, th- I think we were looking back, me and Adi were looking back 
at it, and maybe this was Sunday. We were looking back at scores and it we couldn't tell if you were going to make it or not. And so I had a bunch of questions prepared around there's so much uncertainty. How are you dealing with this? But yeah. it's a it's a totally different tune today, man. So this <laughs> is this is by far your your best open finish, correct? Yes, by far. Far and away. So what happened, man? How'd you do it? This is my this is my seventh open, which is kind of uh, that one's a little baffling to me. Just the fact that I've competed in CrossFit for seven seasons now, yeah. been in the game five times, and this is you know it's that 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 in its own is kind of baffling. But looking back at all of the open performances, um, I've actually gotten a lot of scrutiny, if you will, about not being an open athlete. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> I was at a local gym uh, actually. I think it was earlier this week and they turned to me and they said, well, you know, like, how do you feel, you know, are you pretty excited about how the open is going? Cause you know, you're not really an open athlete. And I was in the middle of training too. So like, I kind of had like this edginess, you know, you know, you're an, when you're an athlete and you're kind of focused, you kind of got an edge and things aren't filtered the same way necessarily. But I kind of turned to him. I was like, now, how do you know that I haven't like in the past opens that I wasn't like, Like, you don't know that I wasn't giving everything I got to those past opens. Like, maybe this year I've just approached it differently. Maybe I am an open athlete. Everybody sits and tells me I'm not an open athlete, but they don't know what kind of approach I took during what open and when, you know? And it was just kind of like, I was like, ooh, I was like, sorry about that. Like, (laughs) didn't mean to get you on there, you know? But, and like, they turned to me like, ooh, like, this is the edge I like to see. This is, I want to see this kind of edge. And that was, that's kind of the difference. It was, this year we approached it with the intent to compete it. We were intentional about every step of the open and how we approached every single workout, how we approached our day-to-day routine to set ourselves up for the open. Like we approached this one differently than we have any other open because this one was different. Mm-hmm. You know, the games ticket was on the line versus we, you know, we're just trying to get to regionals. Right. So yeah. So yeah. intention, routine, that's things that you do no matter what time of season, no matter what's on the line. What, it, what exactly did you change? Was it just we, the, what, just that mental shift? Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, the mental shift was, was massive, but we actually, as a team. So when I talk about as a team, you know, we, we, I think all athletes have some sort of a team behind them working around, but um, specifically me, Ben Bergeron and my wife, Genesee, we all sat down together and we talked about like, Hey, how, how do we want to approach the open? I had just gotten back from South Africa, not, not much longer than two weeks before the open started. Mm. And when we went to South Africa, that was for a sanctioned event. And we actually did not qualify in South Africa. We took second place. And so we kind of came back with the, uh, came back home with the disappointment of, of not, of not qualifying. And it's like, okay, well now what? And we had to look at the open and the rest of the season and determine how do we want to approach this and what's our best chance of qualifying for the CrossFit games? Cause that's the, that's the question. That's the question of the season. When you're a games athlete, you want to get back to the games. So we looked at it. We actually put our sights on a sanctioned event in May. And that was our plan. We were going to start training and preparing for a sanctioned event in May and that's where we were going to compete, and we were going to put our, our eggs in that basket. And then the Open started, and we did week one, and we were going to do the Open just out of the – like like we're a games athlete. Let's just put our hat in there, one, because you never know what happens. And then two, like we're part of the CrossFit community. We want to be in the community and part of it and be able to talk about it. So like, okay, we're still going to do the Open, but we're not going to put our full focus on it and honestly take the same approach that we have – all the past years. So when people say that I'm not an open athlete, it was because I was, I would walk in the gym. I would say, Oh, the open, the open workout is this like, okay, let's, let's give it a go. I didn't set up bars. I didn't worry about transitions. I just did the workout. And then I went to the rest of my training, this five or so other pieces I had the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's how we were going to do this open after 19.1. I, kind of took that same approach. I just walked in the gym and I just offhandedly kind of did the workout and something in me 
didn't it was just like unsettled when I got home and I was like I didn't really feel like I respected my craft I don't really feel like I respected what I'm doing and like if we're gonna do this let's actually do it and we can train the other days but like let's actually give some intent and be intentional about the way that we do this workout so that's when we're like okay like transitions matter and we kind of looked at some different things and we set ourselves up in a good path in order to to get a good score for the um for 19.1 and then 19.2 came out and that was an event that in six in 2016 actually took i think 11th worldwide in that event oh nice so we knew it was a good workout for me and then that was when after that workout was announced we all kind of looked at each other like uh we actually might have a shot here like this actually might be smart too and so it was halfway through week two when we all kind of looked at each other and said hey let's flip a switch Mm -hmm. compete the open and at that point we had already kind of set up you know you you talked about routine and habit in week one we kind of set up those routines and started geeking out on the workouts which is something that i love doing by the way Mm -hmm. like I can nerd out on workouts all day long. Um, and, but that's something that we never did in the past. And we started doing that and we kind of set ourselves up for that. So then when he's, when, when Ben kind of looked at us and he said, let's compete the open, he opened up a floodgate and Genesee and I went to town. Like we we're taking splits, we're, we're writing things down, we're watching people's videos. And like, right. like, oh, it took him seven seconds to, you know, walk to, from the, this bar to this bar. And how can we take, you know, like we nerded out on things. And so I think, yes, I think that started with the mental shift of like, hey, we're competing. Right. But it also, I think, started in something that has kind of matured in me over the years. And that was just needing to honor and respect what I'm doing more. And that's why we saw that in week one a little bit, even though we weren't competing the open in week one. We saw it a little bit in week one because that was something that's just kind of growing in me, I think. So, dude, it's so cool. Do you remember? Let's see, what what year was it? 2012 or 13, we had the, I think it was the seven minutes of burpees or maybe it was the snatch burpee one and people were like pulling out a metronome on their phones. Yes, that was 2013. (laughs) Exactly. I'm guilty, man. There was definitely a metronome going on somewhere in the gym and I was doing my best to to keep up with it what's the what's the the best little trick or hack that you found in the open just by watching videos and geeking out oh that's a really good question um i think the the best hack um man that's actually a really tough one if you go back through all the workouts i think the the best I think the best thing that I learned was actually the importance of when, when it comes to muscle stamina is just not taxing yourself Mm -hmm. too much, which I see a lot in young athletes or, or, or even just a general public, they'll get into a workout. And if it's a stamina play in any, any sort, they don't understand the concept of pacing or, or holding back and they don't have that discipline to hold back and wait until they need to release right you know i think i saw that started uh started a little bit in week two um when you finally get to that last heavy barbell whatever barbell that is for you like you need to have some and you know you need to have some stamina there Mm -hmm. um you need to be fresh in some nature but then in week three i saw that as well so i actually i held back on the handstand push-ups a lot in 19.3 after the after the box step-ups like I oh, kept my heart rate really low and really just kind of took it kind of a little bit more leisurely and really focused on fast rep cycles. Like people forget how important rep cycle is and how fast you actually are doing the rep. Right. Cause if it's right. taking you three seconds to do a handstand push up, and I did it in a fraction of a second, like I can knock out more of those, but that has to do with like how, you know, how fresh you are and how much muscle stamina you have. And then when I got off the handstand pushups, that allowed for me to be a lot more fresh to do the handstand walk faster. So that was one thing that kind of stood out for us. But um, it, it's hard for me to answer that question fully because we actually have um, a note called geeking out and it's, it's in reference to the open. Like it's nice. a note on Genesee and I's phone that we share. It's called geeking out. 
and we have everything that we've learned from 19.1 through 19.5. Very cool. And it's from each workout and it's, you know, it's like, okay, how can we take this and all the things that we learned and how can we apply that to future workouts? You know, so yep. we've had some ideas on how we can do that in training and whatnot. And I think it'll be fun. It'll be a fun, fun approach for the Sounds season. Great, dude. You should post that on your blog when you're done with it. Yeah. I yeah. I would love that. Yeah. It'd be really cool. So I, w I won't go into detail because I don't have your, I don't have your permission to share, but a D told me for the past two or three years of working with you, she could tell around, I think around open time that you were just, you were a little bit antsy. You were a little bit nervous. And this year was completely different. You were confident. You were more relaxed. What, what has gone on since the games this year that's led to this kind of transformation in your mindset? Yeah, that's really interesting. Genesee and I actually were, were talking about, I kind of asked ourselves that question a little bit. And I think she said something that was pretty, it's not the easiest pill to swallow for most people. Cause you, it's not the, it's not the question. It's not, it's not the answer you want to hear, but, um, time, mm -hmm. time and experience and just the maturity that comes with every new experience that you add on to yourself. And that takes time. And I think that having all of those kind of culminating on each other and you can expedite the process. You can, you can talk to experts, you can, you know, you know, talk to gurus and, and coaches and be coached through the process and taught and, and learn it and read the right books and digest the right content. But there's just something about going through it. Right. That matures you and teaches you those kind of things. And I think that when we approached this open this year, uh, it was, okay, how have, we, you know, and, and let's not, let's not forget the fact that we actually take the time to look back and reflect on, okay, how did we approach the last season and how did we approach the season before that? And how did that go? And we ask ourselves those questions when a lot of people, if, if you don't do that and you just move forward and don't look back at, okay, what have I learned in the past? Like going back to the note that I was just talking about of all the things that we learned from the 2019 open. If we took that note and next year we never open it and we never look back at it, not one time. What was the point of taking all those notes and learning all those things? Because most of them you probably forgot. You know, and so we we do that. We look back on some of those experiences that we've had, what has worked well, what has not worked well. And we look at that for future endeavors that we're going into. See, how can we maximize these future endeavors by taking the things that we've learned in the past? And, you know, I think that, that that's a little a, 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 quite a bit of it is just the fact that we've had some maturity or I've had some maturity in competing right. and learning. That takes a little bit of time. Yeah. So looking back now, do you think there's anything in the world anyone could have said to you or any book you could have read that would have given you this level of confidence? I don't think, I mean, not in an instance. I don't think that there was an, in an instance that would have just, Oh, you got it, Cole. Like it's there. Mm -hmm. It was, it's, and that's one of the things that I've actually, I'm fascinated by human relations. Like I, like, like relationships, interpersonal communication, different things like that. I, I love that kind of thing. Like that's some that's, that's something that I want to get into later on in my life. And um, one of the things that I've kind of noticed throughout my life, and I've, I've you know read some things on and see, have seen, um, is an idea for somebody or an experience is so much more potent when it comes from their mind when it's something that they realize, when they think it through, when they're the ones that develop it, rather than somebody telling them and them adopting it and trying to make it their own. And so people, I mean, and it's amazing because somebody could say, if we, if somebody had that, that perfect thing to say to me, that gives me all the confidence in the world and all the, it's like, oh, he, Cole's got it now. Mm -hmm. And they found that and they, they said that to me two years ago. I may not be in a mental space to accept that then, but you say it to me now and it might change and shatter my world and just like completely lift me up because of the mental space that I'm in. And, and so there's a lot of that too. Right. I love what you're talking about. People like people having their own ideas being so much more powerful. I heard this. One of my mentors told me this. 
uh, gave me this frame of when you're coaching someone, you want to minimally support them. You want to give them as as m- little information as possible that they go and do the thing for themselves or they have their own aha moment. And really- what, what happens a lot in coaching is coaches bring their egos into the relationship and they sure. want they want to just teach everything and they want to they want to look like the hero so they rob the person of yeah. coming up with that idea concept aha moment themselves that's really good that's i and, and one of the things that i love that you just brought up was this concept of ego i had uh i had ben bergeron come out to my house uh earlier last year which was that was awesome i'm usually flying out to boston to hang out with him and whatnot mm-hmm. but yeah he, he was able to make it out to the house and um you know when when, when it's a concentrated time like that where you can just sit and talk and, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of dive into some deep stuff. So we were, we were having some deep conversation and I asked him one of the questions, like, what are the, what's the hardest thing that um, you've had to overcome in your lifetime? And we started talking about that and, um, you know, he turned to me and I was the one that asked the question. He, he, flipped, he flipped script. He was like, well, what about you? Like, what's the hardest thing? And it's, it's, it's also like, it's always tough because like you're sitting there asking people and like you ask them the question and it's like, whoa, don't flip the script on me. <laughs> whoa, that's a good question, man. That's a good question. <laughs> Dang, now I have to think about it. You kind of feel bad for putting them through it all right, of a sudden. Right, right. <clears throat> but he flipped the script and he was like, well, what's the, what's the one thing that you've had the most difficulty overcoming in your life? And I kind of just sit and think about it. And then I realized, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so glaring. And that's my ego. Like that's one of the biggest things that I've had to overcome in any situation, especially as an athlete. Uh, one of the things that I, like I tell people a lot, and then I, like a, like a mantra that I've kind of coined is uh, going through sports is like living life and fast forward. You're forced to develop and learn principles that it oftentimes takes a lifetime for people to learn, mm-hmm. and that's just I don't know, just kind of having to overcome overcome your ego and and like realize like oh like i need to take a step back and realize that i don't know everything i have a lot to figure out and that there are people here trying to help me and serve me and that what i'm doing is not just about me it's something far bigger and it's to help other people and i'm not the only person in this world and i don't know so many things that sports kind of kind of can teach you um if you're willing to listen and to learn, but if you're not willing, it's usually because your ego's gotten in the way, you know? And, right. So yeah, I think it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a fun topic. But. Yeah, man. Do you have any specific examples of how this has been a detriment in your career or your life? The ego piece? <sighs> yeah, you know, like, um, I think one of the, actually one of the biggest uh, things that comes to mind was in in high school, there's a there's a a really deep learning curve for me. Um, I was, I guess, I guess what you'd call like Mr. Popular. Okay, that's that's fair. I I, I don't it's I don't I don't like the sound of it, but um, you know I I was captain of the football team, you know starter varsity whatever like all that stuff. Um, you know had a lot of friends and was just kind of popular and. That's something that can always be tough to um, navigate when you're younger. Um, And I actually in high school had a uh, mentally challenged student kind of really take hold to me and really like kind of kind of almost like obsess over the fact that he knew me Mm -hmm. and now we were friends and he would look for me between classes classes and he would want he would come running across the quad like oh like and just going crazy and it had gotten to the point his kind of enthusiasm had gotten to the point where it was actually like turning off my friends to the point where like they didn't want to like be around it they didn't want to be around me mm-hmm. they would see they would see him coming and they would like just peace they would ditch i'm out <laughs> like i'm not dealing with this kid anymore i'm not and like, so I don't know why, but something kind of just like pulled a heartstring and I became attached to him and 
you know, we would start to sit and like have lunch together. It was just, just me and him at a table uh, because people didn't want to sit with us anymore because he was kind of, he would kind of hiss at people, you know, like, you know, and he'd like, he'd get really defensive about me. So if somebody would come and hang out, like he would like smack them or scratch them or something like. Amazing. Yeah. And it was, it, and it was just because his, his, his brain hadn't fully developed yet to the age that he was, he right. was, you know, younger mentally. And, um, he's a great kid and he was just super enthusiastic about everything. So any, anything that he loved, he was just so mm-hmm. enthusiastic. And I don't know why, but that was kind of contagious to me. And I don't, maybe it's just because I'm one of those individuals that does like when I get attached to something, I'm extremely enthusiastic about it. I'm all in. And so there's just something about his personality. that was like, like, like I get that this isn't normal, but I, you also have a soft spot in my heart because I have been so fortunate and given so much, like so much ability, so much like, like talent. And like, so there's like a soft place in my heart for that. And that was something that I had to get over at a young age, just realizing like I could either like really need and want the attention from all of my friends and all of like society and whatnot, or like I can put my focus where something that really matters. And this is like a life that's in front of me that matters way more. And I can put my focus here and really care about this. And it kind of taught me a little bit about just the way that you know, I approach dreams and, and goals and whatnot that I don't need other people's approval. I don't need other people to champion me if I really know that this is the right thing mm-hmm. and this is the right direction that I want to go. And if this is something that is so, so right and, I, and it feels right and I may not know how to articulate it, but it feels so right, then go all in and be there and be willing to be by yourself because eventually people are going to admire that and it's kind of what happened you know i got a lot of praise i can't believe that you would hang out with him the way that you do and the way that you treat him and i don't know it was just that was that was something that really just kind of hit me hard when i was when i was younger i was about 18 years old then so oh it's beautiful man thanks for sharing that yeah yeah So in your garage, there reads a quote. I think I think it's in your garage, Jim. Uh, I will prepare and someday my day will come. Abe Lincoln. Mm -hmm. After and I'm I'm, going to go back to the post 2017 games. You said that you were underprepared. And just like I said earlier, you know, routine, intention, preparation just seems like a part of who you are. So can you tell us more about that games and and what your mindset was going in and just how how exactly you were unprepared yeah um you know in 2017 it's it's like this this asterisk year kind of interesting just when i look back on my career and uh it was the it's probably the year that i'm the most thankful for honestly um i had gotten to this place where I was going to like, I was going to mastermind CrossFit. I was going to, I was going to figure it out and and be able to like find the equation and the answer. Right. And I was going to plug and chug the equation. I was going to punch it. Like, and so like I started dialing in all the 1%, right. Like looking like at all these 1% and I'm going to dial everything in. And, um, there's going to be no reason why somebody could look at this, this, season of preparation of like, Oh, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so perfectly dialed in that like, there's no, there's no chance that he's, you know, going to stumble and fall. Cause it was so perfectly dialed in. It was like that kind of like mentality, like right. I'll do this. And a little bit of my ego was talking sure. and looking back on it, it actually ended up being the most complacent season that I've ever had. It was the most complacent probably year of life. I've ever had like honestly like when I was younger like I had this like kind of like this gritty pit bully like I'm gonna go work and I don't care if you're in my way if you don't want to join me like get out of here like I got work to do Mm -hmm. like this I there's something in my heart that like is pulling in this direction don't like get out of my way and it was that season was so much of like looking around at people for the answer 
And it's like, okay, like, well, okay, well, we're, where, where could we dial this in? Where could we fix this in? And like, I had that, I actually had that talk with a D a lot. That was like, I think that was our second year working together. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember through, this. And like, there were so many times that I would come to her like, Hey, how can we like manipulate this and trick this? And, um, you know, I would, I would fit things into my diet and routine that like, like in like even the general population can intuitively figure out like ah you're an athlete you probably shouldn't be eating that <laughs> like but like I fit it in my macros so it's a, it's fine like and I was finding reasons to justify things and and looking for people for answers and I wasn't taking a hundred percent ownership over my season mm. and I had gotten so wrapped up in dialing in these one percent you know like. I'm going to get a half hour extra, you know, of sleep and I'm going to, uh, be on my macros by the gram every single day, even though that like I fit a butterfingers in like, right. but that like that kind of thing. And, um, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to recover, you know, uh, an hour and a half every single day, whether it be foam rolling or in the norm attack, like everything. I was just like these little nitpicky things. And after the season was over, and like Genesee and I came home and we were having some deep heart to heart talks about it. Like what the heck just happened this last year? Like, and the interesting thing is, is, is that year at the games, um, I had gotten sick while at the games and that was a kind of, that was a funky year. There was quite a few people who got sick that year. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we had an algae bloom in, uh, Lake Mendota. I think the lake that we swam in, there was an algae bloom the week before the games, so there was some buzz that maybe people got sick from the algae bloom when we when we swam in it, like from the bacteria and whatnot. Right. Um, and that's a like that is the perfect thing for where I was that year. That's the perfect like the perfect scenario. I'm looking for all these external reasons and factors to point at and justify why maybe I didn't perform well. And it would have been so easy to look at it. Well, like. I got sick. I got sick at Lake Mendota, like mm-hmm. bacteria. Like, yeah, no, I just got, you know, and like there's pictures. I can pull pictures up. Like I had like uh, um, hand towels like wrapped around my hands and like covering my face in the in the athlete area. And I'm sitting there like and I'm shaking. I'm laying on Genesee's lap just like trying to like sleep between events um, because I was just like, like I, I really didn't feel good. But there was a lot of athletes who also didn't feel good and they outperformed me. But it would have been very easy for me to say it was the lake. Yep. It wasn't the lake. It was me. It was me for an entire season looking for other people to take ownership for my behavior. It was me. And I think that 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 year I had to realize like, wow, like I have been extremely complacent and I have not owned the fact that this is about how bad I want it not how bad other people want it for me. Mm -hmm. And that's when we came home and we realized we had spent so much time focusing on the 1%. We had lost sight of the 10%. Right. And the 10% is go work your freaking tail off, dude. Go get, wake up every single day. And your goal is to work really, really freaking hard every day, every day. And guess what? The 1% dial themselves in. If you focus on the 10%, they, they just fall into place. And when I woke up every day with the mentality of like, I'm just going to grit it out. I'm going to grind. I'm going to give everything I have to this. I'm going to respect and honor everything about the craft. I'm going to just work my tail off. I didn't have the patience to not dial the 1% in. Mm. It's like, I'm going to put this much effort and intensity into this. Like, I'm not going to let that slip by like, no way. And all of a sudden that, you know, like that's when I I started to hear people tell me like in at at the 2018 regionals last year, like, Oh, you, you seem like a different athlete. That was like the mental shift that occurred then, you know? So yeah, it was, that's huge, man. Yeah. yeah, accountability, complete ownership. When you when you say something like that, like what you just said, I think it kind of 
goes over people's heads because it seems so subtle. Like, oh, he just he you know he said it it was him and not the not the ocean or not the not the lake. But this yeah. is this is one of the keys to high performance right here. What was it about the conversation with Genesee? Or just what was going on in your head that allowed you to accept responsibility for your performance and not blame external circumstances? <clears throat> I, I, you know, I had to do some, I had to do some soul searching first. I think, I think there's a little bit of that and like ask myself the tough, be willing to ask myself the tough, tough questions. Uh, one of the things that I focused on over the last couple of years is the, like really accepting that it's okay to be vulnerable that and and that it's needed like you have to be vulnerable with yourself because if you're not willing to be vulnerable with yourself like how are you going to ask yourself the tough questions and answer honestly mm -hmm. you're not going to so what do you and, mean by vul vulnerable with yourself well well i have a i have another saying that i tell people a lot is like look you can you can justify anything you can justify anything like tell me you want to do something i i could probably justify it for you we would find something but if you actually want to like really get to the root cause of why you want to do anything, why you want to be so like, wh why are you passionate? Why is it this fire burn in your heart? Like you have to be vulnerable with yourself to go there because if you're not and you don't open up that ability to be honest with yourself and keep promises to yourself, like you're never going to get to it. You're going to find a reason to justify not not doing it. You'll always find that reason. But if you get to the root cause of why you want to do something, why it's so important to you, why that this, this thing just like this fire is in your soul, you start to be like, all of those justifications just kind of like go to the wayside. It's like, okay, that's bull crap. Mm -hmm. that's, that's bull crap. Like what I'm like, that's not, that's not it. I want this that's not going to help me get there. And that was a place that I kind of had to get to myself. It was like, why, why are you doing this, man? Like, mm -hmm. like, and let's like be honest with yourself. Like, why are you doing this? And had to get past the ego first, uh, you know, and be willing to accept and take responsibility for my actions. Um, and then when we had that conversation with Genesee, um, and you, you used a term just a little bit ago, a little bit ago, accountability. Um, you know, and that's one thing that I, you know, I, I can talk about the importance of is, just, is how important it is to set yourself up with people who will hold you accountable. You know, I've had that in a D with working against gravity and a Genesee every single day where she's, you know, she has left her job to support me 100% in the pursuit of this, you know, and, you know, so she is holding me accountable and we we're on that walk and talking about everything. And that's when, uh, you know, I had kind of had some, you know, some self reflecting and kind of been vulnerable with myself. And she mm -hmm. just asked some right questions of like, you know, what do you really want? And straight up called me out. Like, I don't think that you were giving everything that you can. I think that you were telling yourself that. And had I not been in the right mental space and created that myself by trying to be vulnerable, vulnerable with myself, I do a lot. You know, we talked, I think last podcast about how much, uh, you know, journey, journaling and reflecting and prayer I do in the morning. Um, or just, you know, from time to time, like, you know, if I need to get something out of my head, I get it down on paper or in a note or something of the nature, um, you know, and uh, I've also talked with Genesee about like when you are having self-conflicting thoughts and your mood is going south and you're just kind of bitter, talk to somebody about it. Because when you start to hear those words come out of your mouth, it makes it real. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you realize how unreasonable you're being, and how uh, like you're being a little dramatic. Or listen to yourself, dude. You're making a lot of justifications, and that was one of the things I think that like why our talks are so potent is because I have an accountability partner in Genesee, and I can go and I can get my thoughts out, and she's willing to listen, and then also call me out. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool. It's been a really fun dynamic. So that's amazing, man. Something I teach at seminars sometimes is called the Johari window. It's a, uh, it's basically a model to teach self-awareness and mm. one of the, so there, there are four quadrants. There are things that I know about me, 
things that I don't know about me, things that others know about me and things that others don't know about me. That's and right. so there's this one section that is called blind spots, right? There are things that we don't know about ourselves that others can see. Yeah. And if we allow people to give us direct feedback, they can teach us so many things about ourselves that we just, we can't see, right? Yeah. We, we have these, we have traumas in our life, whether it be uh, severe or, or not severe. Uh, we have things that we learn from our parents that we just think, that's just the way the world works, but it's actually yeah. an obstacle in our way of reaching our goals. Yeah. And if we allow people and don't get defensive when they give us direct feedback, like Genesee gave you, they can be our biggest teachers. That's really good. I really like that. I can see that playing out in my life in a lot of ways. I mm -hmm. honestly, I can see that in a lot of instances where that has, that has happened. That's very cool. The problem that most people run into is that they are so defensive when someone even yeah. approaches a vulnerable topic like that, right? Totally. Most, totally. most athletes, if faced with that kind of feedback, probably would have gotten angry that she even like, how, how, how dare you? I put totally. in so much work. I dialed in all the 1% and it could have, it could have blown up, right? Totally escalated hundred percent. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's so easy. And, but that's, I mean, that's one of the things that human beings, like, I don't care who you are, don't like to be criticized. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't feel good. That's not a good feeling. So it's what's people's like people look out for themselves. They want to feel important. They want to feel cared for. They want to feel loved. So to have all of a sudden have somebody just critique you and it's like, Whoa, Hey, I don't like this. And that's something that you have to like, you almost have to practice those scenarios in your mind. So when they come up, you know how you're going to respond. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I think that that's something really important for people to do, to know, make up in their mind mentally before they get to those situations. That's the type of person I'm going to be when that arises. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when the doers, when somebody does criticize them and give them, you know, uh, uh, critiques, they know how to accept that. And, uh, you know, which I think is really important because like you said, like there are blind spots that we can't see. Like, like there are, there are things that, that about that season that, that a D probably knows about me that I haven't even like talked to her about yet, <laughs> which honestly, like I would love to hear. <laughs> um, you know, so I, that's, I like, I like that a lot. That's, that's a really good point. So now I want to go even further back. You've been really transparent about your issues with eating in college. Is it fair to say, is, is it fair to call what you had an eating disorder or, or it wasn't quite that bad? Uh, you know, it's, that's a tough one for me to, to, to identify. I'm sure that if you talk to an expert or something like that, they'd probably call it an eating disorder. Gotcha. Um, I would say that I was just. I was obsessive and I think it's really easy for society to look at people who have like this intense goal um, and they look at intensity like it's obsessive, like it's a disorder. Mm -hmm. um, like why would you ever be so intense about something? You know, and I actually, I think, uh, um, gosh, Brendan Burchard, we were just talking about him. He has like some, some crazy or, or, or a really good quote about, if people don't think you're crazy yet, you're not quite operating at your full potential mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so people look at you like when you're doing something and it looks crazy, they look at it like, wow, that that's so off. That's so wrong. You have a disorder. It's like, like no, I just really wanted to achieve something. So uh, did it border disorder? Yeah, maybe. Gotcha. Uh, so but what, I, how, So how did it begin and what was really going on? So, um, so I was a running back at the University of Washington and uh, all like my whole life, like all I wanted to do was was be a running back, play as a running back in the NFL. Like that's what I wanted. Um, and so to be a running back at the University of Washington and to see all of these athletes who were on the, <clears throat> you know, who are above me, who are the starters on, the, you know, higher up on the death chart. And seeing what their bodies looked like, and that was something that I had made a connection with, was you're extremely fast. Your muscles seem like they fire and operate at a different level. And I didn't have like the education and the, and the knowledge to understand everything that was going on. All I knew is you look different and you move different. If I looked more like you, maybe I would move more like you. 
And that was just kind of the thing that I had kind of, you know, when I got the, I was a freshman in college and I kind of started to figure out like, okay, so how do I look like you? And that's when I became obsessed with nutritional information, things like tracking macros and counting and, and keeping track and food journals and all of this stuff. Um, what kind of foods helped to burn fat and what it had come down to is all of these running backs and, um, and corner backs and all the people who were fast and had all these fast twitch muscle fibers, they all were super lean and they were cut up and they were jacked. And, uh, so I told myself like, if I look like that, I'm going to be, be able to operate like them. And that was something that, that I had kind of started to think was, was the answer. So that's kind of what slowly started the progression of becoming just so obsessive and possibly having, you know, an eating disorder. <laughs> um, and, uh, it essentially just it dived in and I wanted to get as lean as possible. So I only ate pretty much, you know, broccoli and chicken and, um, I, I just like anybody, uh, the, I think where where I think people really want to know like well why was his eating dis- the way he eated a disorder and it was because like I had gotten to the point where I had like cravings and when people would have and bring around like desserts and stuff like that I would sneak some off to the side I would chew it up get the flavor in my mouth and I would spit it out and like that's bordering some you know eating disorder kind of you know like there's something that's kind of not not right <laughs> I don't know maybe but like, I, and I'd get like super judgmental about what, like how people would eat in front of me. Um, you know, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you would eat that. Like, why would you, you know? And, and that took about probably a year and a half to two years for me to get to like my, uh, you know, my worst point, but it was a slow fade of learning and geeking out about everything that would make, like I found out that blackberries have some sort of uh, enzyme in them that actually helps burn body fat or adipose tissues. Mm. So, like I started just crushing blackberries all the time, you know, <laughs> like all day. Every, yeah. All day, every day, man. Like that's hilarious. weird, weird things like that. Um, but again, I think it was more so just because I had this intense passion to operate and live a certain way and achieve something that that was more of a result than, um, than, you know, the actual, uh, cause, I guess. Mm-hmm. So then what happened? I think at some point you had to gain a bunch of weight to become a fullback. <laughs> yeah. So then, so like I'm, you know, and I've gotten down to probably living around 6% body fat or, or, you know, maybe even less at times. What, uh, what are you at I, now? I've gotten really, what am I at now? Yeah. Uh, I think I'd be right around 8% right now. Um, last time, last time I got body fat done, I was so right you're even eight. leaner. Got it. Yeah. Um, so, so like sitting and operating around 5% body fat. I also wasn't, I was barely taking any carbs too. So like any time that I would had, I had the ability for like life to quiet down. Right. I would just fall. I would just pass out. Cause I didn't have any, I didn't have any energy and I would just fall asleep randomly. It's like, does, does he have narcolepsy? Like, is this a thing? And this, you know, I just wasn't eating for performance. I wasn't eating to fuel my body in any way. I was just eating to stay really, really lean. I was on a constant deficit and cut. I mean, it was really the grand, you know, the grand scheme of things. Um, and then, so my senior year, I was kind of given the ultimatum, like, Hey, look, if you want to get more playing time, we need, we need another fullback. So we need you to move to fullback or you can just keep, you know, doing what you're doing. And like what I was doing was great. Like, but I wanted to be, on the field more like that was something that I want. I wanted to be on the field more and I wanted to give my chance myself the chance to get to the NFL. And I knew that the way to do that was to get stats and the way to get stats is to get on the field. <clears throat> so I wanted to move to, uh, so I decided to move to fullback and that required me to put on 35 pounds, um, or so, uh, maybe even a little bit more than that. And I went from, uh, yeah, 197 pounds to 235 pounds in the span of about four months or so. Um, Jesus. Yeah. And I, 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 I tried doing it healthy at first, like it's just like, okay, like let's take all the knowledge and information that I've gained about how to eat right and healthy. And I'll just start doing it. And I started adding in all these foods, um, you know, and, and eating all this extra food, but I was trying to do it healthy and nothing was really moving the needle. Um, and I had gotten to the point where I was actually eating so much and so frequently that, 
I would eat until I threw up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, and it wasn't like I'm just recklessly eating. It was because like I had calculated out all the food that I needed, needed to be eating and, and the calories that I needed to get in, in order to gain this weight. And in order to do that, I had to eat this many calories. And it's like, I was like, Oh, like I got to get that in. I don't want to, Oh, and I'd eat it and throw up and oh, okay, I got to start over. Like it was miserable. Um, and I, then like, I finally like tossed my hands up and I was like, you know what? Screw this. Like I'm eating so much food and I'm just like, nothing's happening. I'm going <laughs> to, I started going to QOC, which is like, just like a, like a, like a Kroger grocery store. Mm -hmm. And, uh, every Thursday we, I, you know, we, obviously we lived in like the U district. So we were in like a college area and whatnot. I think it was every Thursday they would put their frozen pizzas on sale, 10, 10 for 10. Um, so I'd go to the frozen pizza section and I'll get 10 pizzas. Nice. And then, and the reason, the reason why is because I had went to GNC to look at a weight, a mass gainer and I was going to start taking the mass gainer, but I had done the price per serving of a mass gainer. And it was the same macros as a whole pizza and it cost more per serving. So I was like, wow. I'll take the pizza. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, yeah. So I started doing that, eating, just like crushing anything and everything that I could find, pastas, pizzas, ice creams, um, just did it completely the opposite direction of what I wanted um, because I wanted to play more than I wanted my body necessarily again i think that the body side is just the result of you know the root cause of wanting to compete and why i was just so intense in that so it was a while why why i was willing to go from one extreme to the other mm -hmm. because this is what i want and i think i think this is what it takes to do that you know so um you know i, I remember having my coach one time tell me i was like why don't you just do it with beer and pizza man like just drink a bunch of beer and eat pizza all the time and i, I don't i don't drink and i never have so i was like ah you know, like maybe maybe i'll try it with ice cream pizza and ice cream that sounds great yeah, an ice cream sounds better to me so um but yeah man it was that was a that was a that was an interesting transition to go between those two yeah i imagine man so since then obviously you've gotten shredded again. You're, you're tracking, you're on top of your shit. Um, and now you're in CrossFit, which is kind of a cross between, uh, team sports and bodybuilding and CrossFit yeah. more than almost any other sport. People are like the athletes bodies are glamorized almost as much as the sport itself. Do you feel any, um, pressure to look a certain way and do you have any sort of like body image challenges that come along with that absolutely i i would i would be lying if i said that i didn't um you know i definitely i like the aesthetic look oh, once you get to that point and you see your abs come out and you see veins popping out of your biceps and it's like wow that looks really cool i like that you know and and you kind of get like these these you know hits every time you look in the mirror it's like wow that looks really good mm -hmm. and it's like you you kind of want that um so like I, it, it, I would be lying if i said i didn't but um i think that at the same time if if we found out and learned that me being a little bit more you know not quite as lean means that i'm going to perform better and whatnot i think that i would lean towards that and be like okay like let's let's go in there i just also think that i offer i like i feel better and i feel like i operate better at a little bit leaner body uh, sure. uh leaner body mass i think that i have gone too far uh as a competitor in crossfit i think that i've gotten too lean and uh, i just didn't have the energy i think that one of the important things that a d has helped me realize and has coached me through with wag was eating for performance and how important that is and which is something that i think that more people also could like it, just the general population can learn how to do is how to eat for for, for performance whatever performing looks like in their life mm -hmm. you know they don't have to necessarily be, you know be doing fran in two minutes they could just be you know going to the gym for 30 minutes a day and getting their workout in and you know being super successful in their business or chasing three kids around, whatever that is, but eating for performance, I think is, is really something that has 
become a huge key factor in how I operate from day to day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's always this balance between physiology and psychology, right? There, there might be one diet that's best for you physiologically, but if you don't psychologically feel good in your body, you don't feel confident. This is especially true for women. If they don't yeah. feel confident about their bodies, then that affects your performance as well. So it sounds like you found that perfect balance of feeling confident and actually being fueled perfectly for your performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been good. It was great. So we're about to wrap up, but I've got a few questions before we end about your marriage. So a D tells me, you know, you, you can only know so much about someone through social media, but I've got an inside scoop on you. And so a D, a D tells me that you've got a really incredible marriage and she really doesn't, she doesn't hand that card out very often. She doesn't say things like that very often. So with fi like 50 plus percent of couples getting divorced and even more just wow. living in terrible marriages, what do you think really makes you guys successful? Mm. Um, we actually were have we're again we're I think one of the themes that, that you can just hear, I was just about to say, like we were having this conversation the other day. Um we communicate a lot. Mm. We talk a lot. Yep. Um we get to know each other, you know, and I think that's one of the um right there is one of the biggest keys is we we know each other. Um she knows, you know, my darkest thoughts and my happiest thoughts, and I know hers. And, uh, you know, it's, and it's because we talk about it and I, I ask, she asks, you know, we're willing to be vulnerable with the other person and, and talk about those kind of things and, and really, really love the other person. And that was something that we were talking about the other day was like, like, it's so great how we wake up every day and we try to make the other person fall in love with this all over again. Like it never happened before. Like, it's like, I want, I want you to fall in love with me today. And what that looks like for us is serving each other and being there for one another and trying to make the other person smile and have fun with the other person and be willing to help and go out of the, go out of your way for the other person. And it's amazing what you'll see when that happens, starts to happen is if you give more of yourself to the other person, they in turn will turn around and want to give more of themselves to you. Yes. And I tell that to people all the time. Like that's a, that's, that's, that's a human relation thing. Like if you give all that you have, you're going to have all that you need because people are going to see that they're going to recognize that. And you know, like there's, 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 um, you know, science on it and the like serotonin levels and, oxytocin and leadership roles and all these different things that play into it and really what it is is just this relationship that gets built when somebody gives something of themselves and it's like wow like thank you so much for that like how can i help you mm -hmm. and then you start doing that for each other and you see that in friends you see that in marriages you see that in business you see that in, and i think that that's just something that you know it, it's almost it's almost like we've just become so infatuated with it's like you help me so much all the time. Like, what can I do for you? And then it just full circle all the time, man. So, oh man, so, so much good shit in there. Um, it's all about the habits that you cultivate, right? So you guys have a habit of treating each other almost as if you're still dating. It sounds like, right. You're still courting each other. And, yeah. We, everyone hears this, like this is the way to make a marriage last. Like you have to continue dating, et cetera. But it's so hard because we take for granted what is closest to us, our family, because yeah. we, we believe that they're always going to be there. So we don't have to delight them and have adventures with them and, you know, try to make them smile on a daily basis. Yeah, but if you get in the habit of, of doing that, like you do, your life and your relationship will just be on fire. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually really interesting that you brought up like just like family and whatnot, because I, I have gone through seasons, uh, you know, CrossFit seasons, competitive seasons where um, I played the I'm too busy card, pulled it too many times. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, like, like, like people weren't really all that interested in what I had going on. And it was because I stopped answering my phone. I stopped replying to text messages. I stopped 
being available for other people because my goals and my dreams and blah, blah, blah. And then, then I kind of clicked, kind of clicked. I was like, I'm not, I'm not giving anything of myself to other people. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to get behind what I'm doing? It's just a selfish act at that point in their eyes. So, you know, and, and so I actually, honestly, I, I was vulnerable with myself and I said like, man, like you need to start being there for people more and worrying about other people's dreams and goals too. And like actually caring. And it was actually amazing the kind of responses I started to get from people and them not knowing that I was, you know, doing this, like this is, you know, an internal affair that I was having with myself. Mm. Um, and I was like, cause I was curious to know like how people would start to respond and people's response and how excited they are for me for taking six in the open or for how I'm doing throughout the year really increased. And it was really interesting to see that it's like, Oh, like if you love and care for other people more, they're going to do the same for you. So, yeah, I, I really like you. You hinted that at this earlier, which is be more of, be more of what you want from others, right? If you want patience, be more patient, kind, be more kind, et cetera. Exactly. That's awesome, man. So you, you, multiple times throughout this show, you've mentioned being vulnerable with Genesee. A question that I get from people all the time is, okay, you gave us this like series of questions to ask each other or this exercise, but how do I begin that type of conversation? It seems so like formal and difficult. How do you guys start a vulnerable conversation? <laughs> uh, that's probably almost tough for me to answer because it's, it's become such a habit. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I'm not afraid to say like, Hey, I need your help. There's cue words that you can use with people. And I think one of the things that is important in human relations is to make the other people, other person feel important as well. So, if I want Genesee to help me and I want to be willing to be vulnerable with her, she has to be in the mental space to be able to want to help me, to want to serve and critique and, and, and be there. So I have to give her the four. I have to give her that space and say, hey, like, I know that you see this and I really value your opinion. I really value the words that you say. And you kind of give them the, this honor and respect that they deserve in your life. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, oh thank you. You're like, yeah, like I, I've seen this. And it kind of sets them up in the right mental space to, mm -hmm. to want to help you because you've respected the, that about them. Right. But it's kind of, you know, if you approach it with this, you know, kind of like your ego, like, ah, like, hey, like, uh, you know, I've kind of been noticing some things and just kind of wondering what, you know, kind of wondering what you, what you see. And it's like, well, uh, you know, you're fine. Like, I don't really see, I don't really see anything, but you really come to them and like, Hey, like, like I, like I respect and I value what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what are you seeing? Cause I really want to grow and I really want to be better for you. And I want to be better for other people. And I think it's easy for people to champion something that is outside of the other person. So it's like, if I'm sitting there, if I'm, t if I walk up to Genesee, I'm like, Hey, like I want to get better, um, at, you know, I want to be a better person because, uh, it makes me feel good about myself. Like she doesn't want to get behind that. Mm -hmm. But if I told her like, Hey, like I want to be a better person because I want to, I want to be better for our community. I want to, uh, you know, I want to know how to respond better, uh, to my family and I want to be able to serve you better. It's like, that's a little bit easier to get behind, you know? So I think kind of approaching things in that way and setting up the other person to make them feel honored and respected. So they want to speak life into you. I think mm -hmm. is important. I like that, man. Yeah. We we've got three, I think that we reuse that are just super simple. Um, one is, Hey, can I share something vulnerable with you? Two is, mm -hmm. Hey, can I make a request? And three is, Hey, can I give you some feedback? And, at our best, we kind of lower our, our voice a little bit. We lower our tone and it comes across really softly. And then mm -hmm. if we're pissed, it comes off a little bit differently, but that's yeah. just how it comes off. And when, when we hear one of those three things, like you said, we're in such a good rhythm with just respecting what the person is about to say that's sharing something vulnerable. And even though, even though it's uncomfortable, 
receiving information sometimes, we know that on the other side is something better, right? A higher version of our relationship or a higher version of that person or ourselves. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's one of the things that you have to remember is like the other, your spouse or your significant other wants the best for you too. Yep. You know, and it's like, so when you know that and they come at you and they, you know, you approach them or they approach you and you have that in your mind, I don't know, you, you're open, you're, you're a little bit more open to everything. If you can just remind yourself like, hey, they want the best for me too. Um, awesome, brother. Well, Cole, I'm proud of you, man. Sixth place. You. It's going to be a great year for you. Yeah. Yeah. Really looking forward to it. Very grateful for everything that, that, you know, I'm getting to travel down and the journey that I'm getting to go down. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Love it, man. What's the next step for you? Are you going to do any more sanctionals for competition practice or are you just getting ready for the games now? Oh, uh, so we will, we will start games prep, um, pretty soon. And I mean, I think that's one of the most exciting things about qualifying through the open. It's like, we have this like new like timeline to prepare for the right. games. It's Cool. But we will actually do the rogue invitational. That is okay. something I'll do. Um, being a rogue athlete, I think it'd be really fun to go out and do uh, the rogue invitational. So um, yeah, that's in May. I think May 18th. So we'll kind of set on that. But um, yeah, just kind of take the season and, and enjoy it, man. Excellent, man. We're rooting for you. Where can people yeah. find you on social media? Uh, at Cole Sager 35 and uh, YouTube channel Cole Sager. And you've got your you've got a website with a blog where where can people find that yeah uh colesager.com amazing right. you the man right. thank you so much for your time cole i hope thank you so much man i had a lot of fun really appreciate you brother this episode is finished but your training journey continues head over to brute strength training.com slash ssw and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately that's brutestrengthtraining.com slash SSW.